Today's topic, as Adina mentioned, is about neurodiversity and how does it affect each and every one of us. So let's see if we can actually talk about what neurodiversity actually is. It refers to the fact that people may experience, interact, or connect with the world in many different ways. I believe you probably heard an expression saying, follow the crowd. This is something that actually neurodiverse people don't do very well. Something that can look very natural to neurotypical people is usually very difficult or more difficult for neurodiverse people. I wanted to share the example. We needed to go and get COVID tested. In order to prepare our son for that, I was thinking about how can I do this? I refer to a uh, word he is familiar with, and the word is a doctor. So I showed him out of the window, I showed him the medical staff outside the building. And then because, of course, as any teenager or most teenagers today, he really enjoys watching YouTube videos, I found on YouTube how COVID test is getting done. So I showed him the video and I explained, we will go downstairs, we're going to meet a doctor, you need to pull your mask off, you need to open your mouth, you need to wait for them to take the swab, and I explained the whole procedure by also giving him the example he can understand. For typical people, neurotypical people, this is like an easy thing to do, they just follow the crowd, they go anywhere, they see what everybody else is doing, and they just continue. But for neurotypicals, it's not so simple. This is why today I want to give you more examples so you can see the difference and feel the difference because just being weird around your friends doesn't make you neurodiverse for sure. What is also neurodiversity is that there is no one right way of communicating, behaving, thinking, and learning. We are used to, as typical people, to pick up those social rules and follow them very naturally, but for neurotypicals, this is not very simple. So this is why neurodiversity refers to this, like there is no right way, and unless the person is being hurtful to themselves or others, we should be able to recognize there is the different wiring in their brain, and they just see the situation from a different perspective. With neurodiversity, the differences are not viewed as deficits. They are most likely viewed like different abilities. Neurodiverse people usually struggle with reading social cues. Let's see what isn't neurodiversity. Being referred to as a weirdo by your friends or at work or parties or elsewhere, that's not enough to just consider yourself a neurodiverse person. Feeling like you don't fit in with most of your surroundings, also, it's not enough. Being bad at reading and good at math, for sure it's not. Not having many friends or social experiences also doesn't make you neurodiverse by default. It's actually the overall wiring in, in a person's brain. And uh, as I already said, it can result with not being able to read social cues, but also it goes to some other levels. For example, not many uh, neurodiverse people and uh, autistic people per se, are verbal. That includes our son. This is one of the um, main things people can notice if they have a person like that in their surroundings. It's difficult to communicate. It's difficult to verbally express what they want to say. Some simple tasks like tying the shoelace can be very difficult. On the other hand, they can have many different abilities that are amazing comparing to typical people. Me and my husband sometimes are very surprised when we see some things our son can do. He learns many things by himself, and as soon as he learned them, that's it. He, you don't need to remind him, you don't need to ask him again, he doesn't need to repeat that. But actually for many autistic people, it's very important to repeat and do the same thing all over and over again. But this is not just autism per se, this is also a comorbidity with maybe OCD or ADHD or something else. What is autism? It's a lifelong genetic condition. It's a neurological condition related to brain development. Different wiring in the brain impacts the way a person connects to others and surroundings. Signs can be noticed in early childhood and even with babies. 
On this slide, you can also notice some of the things, how neurodiversity affects everybody. Since it's a genetic condition, it can happen to any of us. Of course, there is no user manual, right? So I remember myself when I was pregnant with our son, since I used to be a basketball player and I'm a fan of sports and my husband is a musician, we both have some ideas. Wow, when he is born, he's gonna be great at this or that. I think this is what every parent will do. After we started noticing something is not as expected, all of those ideas started changing. I believe it's very common for the parents in that situation to become desperate, angry, upset. Maybe some people, they would blame each other. Some parents will blame themselves. But actually, being a genetic condition doesn't mean that any of the, of the parents is the faulty one. It's just the genetic combination. When I wanted to mention the signs that can be noticed in early childhood, I remember uh, our son was only three months old when I first recognized something is definitely different. Even since he was a really newborn, we could notice something. My mom was also aware, like, maybe by this time he was supposed to do this and that. And uh, he did, but differently. I remember, like it was yesterday, he was only three months old and I was feeding him. Some show was on TV. They had a topic and then they went into autism and then they started doing a quick walk through, like what would the symptoms be? And I was like reading all of those 10 and I could recognize seven or eight in our son. And he was only three months old. Being young parents, whenever we would go somewhere to ask questions, Everybody will say, oh, don't worry, you guys are so young, you don't know anything. It's a baby, baby sir. You know, they have their own pace, he is a boy, he will grow differently. Boys are usually lazy and late, so they would dismiss us. But actually, now from this distance, and even then, I knew I was right, but I just couldn't prove <laughs> to the experts that I am right. Many signs can be seen in, uh, in early childhood, for sure. This is our, our experience. Now let's see what isn't autism. Yes, like we mentioned already, not everyone is a little bit autistic. It's not some magical superpower. It can bring some advantages, but also it has its own disadvantages, right? According to autistic adults, it's not something to feel pity for. Nobody likes to feel like someone is feeling sorry for them. This is also, this also goes both ways for the autistic people and also for us pa as parents. I'm always very, I can't say upset. I got used to that. But when I was younger, I would be upset, even upset, when somebody would tell me, oh, you're so brave. It's a situation that happened and now we have this reality. And can you imagine somebody asking you or calling you brave just because you, you know, went to work or made breakfast or just uh, slept through the night? This is how it feels because for us, this is normal. Uh, making it sound like something extraordinary can make people feel bad, no matter if those are parents or it's an actual autistic adult, because usually kids may be less concerned about this, but also depends on the on the child. Anyway, it's not very necessary to express that, like, oh, I feel sorry for your situation. Ah, it sounds so, you know, not good. <laughs> very important thing is that autism or neurodiversity also, it's not a phase kids will grow out from. In our country and um, actually even in online community, I'm very active and I'm always trying to research more and find out more and listen more and contribute more. Most autistic people would say this is a big problem because many services are directed to kids and many services they stop after kids are expected to start either primary school, either they reach puberty, either something like that. Like there will be a period of time when the service will stop and then these kids are left in no, no man's land. 
for example, our son is almost 15. And of course, he's much different than he was when he was a baby. He started saying his first words when he was at the age of six. Can you imagine six is already very late? Of course, he's very different now, but he still struggles a lot with communication, verbal communication. He can express anything he needs, but he still can't go into the conversation, approach somebody and say, hi, my name is this and I like music, I like ice cream, I have a toothache or something. That doesn't happen. He still can't come and maybe retell the dream he had. He's becoming an adult already. He's already in full-blown puberty. He's growing as he's eating, I don't know what, <laughs> growing like out of the water. What is the big concern is that eventually us too, as parents, will not be here. He's going to be by himself. But what if in 10 years time or 40 years time, he still can't communicate and he still needs support, but support is only directed to small children. I'm trying to show you the picture. The services shouldn't stop when kids grow. They should continue as long as possible and evolve because one autistic person doesn't equal everybody else. Everybody is different and everybody needs different supports. Some of them don't need any support. There should be choices, and this is what we want to work on. What causes autism? As we said, it's genetic, which means people are born autistic. They are not becoming autistic. This is very important to be aware of. So I already gave my example of how we recognize some signs when he was just a baby. And of course, with a, such a small baby, nobody will listen to you. You know, you just show up somewhere with a three-month-old baby and ask, is my baby autistic? And they laugh at you and they send you home. <laughs> We tried again when he was around a year and a half. We were told we are young parents, we don't know anything, and he's too small. So we went to a neuropsychiatrist, and she was a very famous doctor in our community. And I specifically asked her, is he autistic or not? This is what I came to find out. So I didn't go there with, you know, randomly just showed up. I wanted to let her assess him and then tell us what she thinks. What happened was she told me, okay, you can let him walk around the doctor's office and she just continued asking us some other questions like how was he when he was younger she never tried to engage with him or talk to him or no no communication whatsoever verbal or nonverbal and then after maybe 10 or 15 minutes she, she said okay you don't need to worry he's not autistic for sure so I said okay how can you tell she told me he is not holding his hands like this if you can you look at the screen she said he's not holding his hands like this like with a thumbs inside. Okay, so my husband saw my face becoming furious because this is really not enough to determine if somebody is autistic or not. So then I said, okay, thank you, bye-bye. And uh, that was one of the moments I can remember where I really lost my faith in uh, experts in the whole system. It's not being taken seriously enough. It's just like a piece of paper, it exists and nobody cares. This was the feeling I had then. And that was 2009. What I want to share next is what doesn't cause autism. For sure, watching TV as a baby doesn't do it because we learned previously already that it is a genetic condition. Kids watching TV or not watching TV, it doesn't make any difference, right? Also, vaccines, they don't cause autism. Even now, many people believe that. Many case studies already debunk this myth. It's already well known that the person who was responsible for the first case study that was talking about this and MMR vaccines, that doctor was disbarred and his uh, case study was found futile, but still many people would believe this. Why? Because this specific vaccine comes at an age of two and a half years old. And this is the age until when the child should already be walking, talking, doing everything. If it doesn't, then it's like a very good time frame. Oh, receive the vaccine and he doesn't talk. Bad diet for sure doesn't cause autism. It can cause many other things, but not, you know, something less uh, serious. And of course, the surroundings don't.
uh, there used to be a lot of stories about cold mother syndrome, where mothers were blamed for making kids autistic because they were not caring enough. There were a lot of stories about kids becoming autistic when they are left as babies in orphanages, or they are left by parents, or they've been raised by grandparents or some other relatives. This is what surrounding means. There will be always this kind of stories that some things are just uh, influencing a person to become autistic. No, there are no such things. There could be some things that can enhance autistic traits in them. For example, if they are already autistic and then something happens and their anxiety goes up, they become nervous or they become scared and then they need to express the fear and maybe they're not verbal so they will express it in a different way. So this is when the surroundings does affect them, but not making, it doesn't affect people by making typical people into autistic people. No, it's impossible. I believe that when I mentioned watching TV as a baby can help in developing some language and some vocabulary, even through Ecolalia. Um, because autistic kids are very keen on repetition, especially when they are younger. So they would always ask maybe to see the same cartoon, to see the same piece of the cartoon many times during the day, which can also be useful for language development later. Also, right now in the autistic community, there are many devices that are helping autistic people communicate. So for autistic people, this is like a blessing because they can use their own preferred way of communication. I saw many examples. Many people, as I said, they are not verbal enough. They will use typing. Many people are very good at verbal speaking, but they only focus on something that is very interesting for them. So they lose the audience, which means it's also better for them to combine. Maybe they can send voice messages and they can also type some answers. There are many different devices for AAC users. Those are kids and adults who can't communicate in any other way except showing the letters on the, on the alphabet board or maybe using this kind of a device that would have different folders inside so they can choose the folder. For example, feelings, then they would go into that folder. They would find a feeling they feeling right now. So this is the way how they can communicate with the caretakers or parents or even in school. For us, one of the challenges was also getting into school and finding, I can't say the right way because I'm not sure yet if that is the right way, but it's the way we are doing it. I want to talk about the diagnosis a little bit. Is it necessary or not? First of all, if the person is already adult, uh, that should be a personal choice if the person can't express their choice, yes. For example, our son, even though he's almost 15, he can't express his own choice in this matter. There is no way we can tell if he understands the meaning. I'm autistic, I'm not autistic. We don't know yet if he can understand that. So for us, we can't just confirm with him. But if the person can understand what that means, should be a personal choice. I think as far as I learned throughout our experience, of course, the diagnosis is not necessary, but it's helpful and useful in many cases. It can go both ways. It can bring clarity. It can also bring shame. I know many examples uh, of parents where they would feel ashamed about the child being autistic and they would just not accept it. And uh, in that situation, everybody will struggle. The parents struggle and the child struggles and then the struggling child becomes a struggling adult and then the whole setup is very negative. On the other hand, it is normal to feel afraid, normal to feel guilty, normal to feel was there something I could have done to prevent this. And also both of us, uh, my husband and I, we also went through all these emotions I remember myself when he was still small, so probably my brain was still believing like, oh yeah, he is, something is different, but he is still small and um, there is a chance 
he will just wake up normal. At that time, I didn't know any vocabulary. I didn't know anything. So I thought like maybe he's going to just wake up normal. Then if people on the street would ask me something or wanted to talk to him when he was already growing and then he wouldn't respond, then they would ask me what's wrong with him. And of course, as a young mother, I would feel so hurt. And I will say, I was trying always to say something like, he doesn't communicate much, he doesn't speak much, he's just shy or something like that. But actually I knew, I knew I was kind of lying to myself and, you know, lying to that person. But if I would try to say, I believe, we believe, we think he's autistic, I would start crying and I would start falling apart. And then I just decided I can't deal with that every time somebody asking me something. So I just went, you know, this way. Of course, later, when we all came to terms with that, now I can talk about it. No problem. You can see I don't have any emotional reaction about that, especially not like I'm sad. I'm um, I don't know why this happened to me or no, why. What did I do wrong? No, I don't have any of those reactions, but I did feel different emotions while I was dealing with that when he was younger. Something that is really important in autistic community is very valid and totally valid to get self-diagnosed. What does that mean? There are many online tests available for you to just go and click through. They have 40 to 50 questions. As soon as you're finished, the test will give you the result. Out of those 50 questions, they will count how many questions are showing the autistic traits in you. So for example, my result is 15 out of 50, which is not enough. My husband's result is 10 out of 50, which is also not enough. So uh, he got diagnosed by experts. And um, what, how did that help us? It helped us with his school. And actually back home in our country, if you have, if you're a parent of a child with any learning disabilities or different abilities or autism or anything, you can apply for some government uh, support system. It's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. They would also provide that was actually really late before we came to China. They started providing like a personal assistant for the for the child, which means first three years of his primary school, my husband and me, we were with him in the classroom. It's a mainstream school, so like 30 other kids and our son and me or our son and my husband. So we are going to school again. <laughs> uh, also, the curriculum for him would be different, less content to go through in order to get the grades. and we were in the role of the personal assistant. Of course, there is always somebody who needs to, you know, go and push somewhere. So we went to the city hall and we pushed a lot. Maybe a year before coming to China, we got granted by the city hall to be able to hire personal assistants out of uh, medical staff, like uh, nurses who went to high school or maybe some other certification and they don't have the job. They could apply and get trained to be the personal assistant. So we got a personal assistant for our son and also 25 other kids also got because we went to ask for it and pushed a lot so eventually we did it and um, then when we came to China we continue schooling him back home online because this is more suitable for him because of the language until now and for later we don't know we're gonna see so in this way for us uh, getting him diagnosed was helpful because he had resources and we had resources to lean on to but you know we never know maybe in two years or four years he will just tell us why did you get me diagnosed maybe he will uh, acquire the way to communicate more and maybe he will be upset about it how should we know you know it's it's something we just would need to deal with that if it happens this is something that is also quite important. Uh, how does it usually work? Some autistic people, they prefer identity first language, which would put it like, these are autistic children or I'm autistic. And some other people would prefer person first language, which means I'm a person with autism. But for autistic people, as far as I know from my experience and communication with them, they usually prefer to say I'm autistic because the main point is that autism is not an illness. It's a spectrum and the people who are on the spectrum, they spent their whole life in that spectrum. They might, you know, move uh, back and forth because this is also another subject. When they are emotional, they can go into regression and they can behave like a five-year-old. Um, 
but still they are on the spectrum. So it's not an illness and it doesn't need a cure. So this is why they don't like saying, I'm a person with autism, because this, this would mean like I'm a person with headache, you know, so I'm gonna take a pill and headache is gonna be gone. They prefer saying I'm autistic. This is like inseparable piece of their personality. In order to be careful with the, your wording, it's best to ask the person personally if they can communicate verbally or with, a, with an iPad or something, ask them. If not them, then ask the caretaker. And we can tell you how to refer because this is the same way we refer to him. This is the safest way, just check every time with every person because getting to know one of this person doesn't mean they're all the same and they all expect the same from you. So we just ask and see what their response is. Now, the main point of our today's talk would be how does neurodiversity affect you? Actually, neurodiversity and autism and many others like ADHD, dyslexia and other different abilities that come under this umbrella of neurodiversity. They have one special um, thing about them. Usually they are invisible. Invisible in what way? It's still referred to these conditions like disability. But when you hear about a disabled person, usually the picture you have in your head is somebody maybe in a wheelchair or something similar. But for neurodiverse people, they look like everybody else. There is nothing physically that will make them obvious to you they are neurodiverse. There's nothing. Since it's like that, we consider it like an invisible condition, invisible, different ability, however you wish to call it. But the point is it's invisible, which means when we are outside among other people, we have no idea if some of them are autistic or not, neurodiverse or not, we can't tell. We should be aware these people are around. You know, they exist, they share the space with us. Other than that, as we mentioned, it's genetic, which means it can happen to anybody, any time in their life. So it can enter your life at any, any point, like it did for us, we never thought that might happen. And the only thing we, we knew about autism was from old movies like Rain Man, which has nothing to do with, with the real situation, right? It can enter a person's life at any time. You might be in close contact with a neurodiverse person or people. That means they may be your bosses. You may be their boss. You guys can be partners, friends. They can be your family members, or they can come into your family by getting into a relationship with some of your family members. You might also be in love with an ND person. It can happen. It's actually happening a lot. I believe this is also one of the reasons why it happens a lot recently is because exactly because of the technology, because the technology gives uh, uh, ND people more opportunities to communicate, to find out about outside world, to communicate with people from other countries, to text, to type, to uh, FaceTime and everything. So. Uh, many of them are getting into a relationship, they're getting married, they have kids. Sometimes both of the people in the relationship are neurodiverse, sometimes not. One is, one isn't, they still match and they go through life together. It's pretty common now that you might fall in love with an ND person too, even maybe create family and you know the whole life and everything. So it's really important we start accepting that this is actually going on. It's good to, that we are having this conversation so we can become more aware. I'm gonna give you a minute before I go back to our dear Adina. This is my um, personal WeChat code and my official accounts WeChat code, my email. If you have anything, any idea, any comment, any feedback, any question, anything. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for sharing. I can actually share the screen again on my side. 